you just joining us, it would be wonderful if you could introduce yourselves in the chat and perhaps say what your interest is. I can see we've got people from across the UK and various roles relating to Net Zero, and we're delighted to be hosting this event as part of Net Zero Week, the U UK's National Awareness Week. Um, and certainly as somebody working in Net Zero, I really, really welcome this initiative and the possibility of getting together and uh, learning from each other. So um, we are one of many webinars taking place this week and at the end of the session we'll share with you the link for other webinars which you'll be able to join. But for today um, we will be joined by, by our final external panellists. We've had a slight technical issue, forgive us for that. Here she is. Welcome Charlotte. Sorry for any um, tensions there. So I'm just welcoming people, asking them to introduce themselves in the chat. We're delighted to be uh, a partner with Net Zero Skills Week and um, the National UK National Awareness Week for Net Zero. And this webinar session is Net Zero Skills and the Role of Universities. And this is important both for universities, for those seeking to upskill and reskill in Net Zero, and also for employers. And one of our invitations to employers uh, or to people who are recruiting for Net Zero Skills is join us, work with us, tell us what you need, tell us what you need us to be doing. So I just want to get that message out there at the very beginning. Um, we really welcome collaboration to ensure that you are getting people with the net zero skills you need in industry. Um, so our slide now at the start of the session introduces the panel. I'm Dr Victoria Hans, I'm Director of Sustainability at the Open University and I'm delighted to have a panel representing various stages of the Open University journey. Um, so we have Professor Stephen Peake, Professor of Climate Change and Energy and Stephen has long been an inspiration of mine. I hadn't realised he was somebody who wrote my climate and energy resource book while I was studying at university. So thank you, Stephen, for that inspiration. And we're joined by Dr Freya Wise, who's currently a visiting fellow with us at the Open University, having completed her PhD with us in retrofitting amongst other things. Um, and that's what she's going to be focusing in. And we're joined by our current uh, PhD student, Ramla Khan, who I met recently, who's researching and very active in terms of trees. And we're all being exhorted to plant trees as a solution to capture carbon. And it's a bit more complex than that, isn't it, Ramla? And Ramla's going to be sharing her uh, latest research and her very interesting per perspectives which from my view need to enter our policy making um, and we're joined by Charlotte Bonner um, who's CEO of the Alliance for Sustainability Leadership in Education um, and Charlotte is giving us that overview perspective and the Open University is very proud to be a member of the Environmental Association of Universities and Colleges um, and we are very collaborative as a sector so we really there, there aren't any winners in climate change unless we have climate safety. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm really looking forward to this session and hearing what the speakers have to say. You'll be, I'm going to invite every speaker to um, share uh, some of their views, their key messages in just a couple of minutes uh, each. And then we're going to have a bit of a discussion amongst ourselves, which I hope you find interesting. And certainly we don't know which direction that's going to take us in. Um, we'd love you to put your questions in the chat as they come up. Um, Thanks for joining us, uh, those of you still joining us. We'd just love you to introduce yourselves in the chat. We're not going to be looking at it now. It's a bit distracting for us as we're speaking, but I can see from looking up to now that we have a range of colleagues from within the Open University, external organisations, employers, and it looks like some students. So welcome everybody. Without further ado, we are going to kick off this uh, webinar as part of Net, uh, the UK's Net Zero Week, the UK's National Awareness Week. So welcome. And I am going to invite Professor Stephen Peake to set the scene and uh, share your perspective. Thank and you very much, Victoria. Stephen, and I, I suspect I know why. Um, Thank you very much, Victoria, for that introduction and welcome everybody. It's, I'm delighted to be part of this week, delighted to be part of this panel. 
I am I'm in the OU library, which is a beautiful building, and I've just been bumped out of my quiet corner by the OU gardening group, um, <laughs> which is a skill for net zero. And they're very active. They're just setting up for some something going on. So there you go. A quiet corner in the library and, and bumped by 20 gardeners who I'm sure are going to be talking about uh, the effects of climate change. Look, um, so net zero, uh, very quickly, let me be slightly provocative. Um, um, it's too much of a brand, this phrase, actually, and the net too often means not because everyone's jumped on that uh, that bandwagon. It doesn't always mean that, but it, it really, what does it mean scientifically? It means uh, reducing emissions to an absolute minimum and then where they have to be neutralised by some negative emissions. That's kind of what, what we're doing. Too often in business and, and public sector at the moment, people don't really get that now. We're in a very, very serious situation. We will have excursions, annual excursions into 1.5 by the end of this decade regularly. And I'm afraid, you know, if you just study the latest IPCC, IPCC AR6 science, you see that we're heading towards two degrees by 2045, and that's average. So that means, you know, you've got you've got regional amplifications for that across the world. So. We've got these dual tasks, these dual skill sets to learn, which is what are we, what on earth are we going to do about the temperatures that are now locked in, particularly up to mid-century? Um, and how are we going to deal with that as we heat up? We've got to actually then implement really radical programs for decarbonisation. And they're, they're two complementary and different skill sets. I mean, too often net zero is seen as a, what is it? If you, if you say to leaders, what's net zero, you'll get a range of answers. It's a, it's a project, it's a brand, it's a mindset, it's a license to operate, it's a, it's a business model innovator, it's a creative engine, it's a organizational learning, it's, in, it's inconvenient, it's, it's process theater, it's just we do it because we're supposed to do it. And that's not a very good answer, by the way. And, or it's somebody else's problem is a very common, <laughs> it's a common answer you get inside an organization. Of course, the answer is it's all of the above. And when I think about net zero skills week, um, one thing that's on my mind is that we tend to think about the workforce. If you look at the literature that's available, we tend to naturally talk about the workforce. But I think the skill sets are not just those of the workforce. Um, they're everybody in society, uh, whether they're classed as working or not. And I think that's something we shouldn't lose sight of. And I think we do. If you look at the detailed reports available in the UK, for example, commissioned by the Climate Change Committee, look, excellent as they are, they are just dealing with one set. So I think our skill base as society to respond to and adapt to um, climate changes is much bigger than the workforce. The workforce is important. And of course, in the workforce, we classically mean the new exciting jobs and roles that will come in agriculture and land use, in energy demand side management, in energy supply side management and transport. And that's typically the way we would, we would chop uh, the cake up if we the problem up if we were looking at it from the workforce point of view and there's you know very very exciting careers and skills um I went to the science um, museum recently I had an hour to spare before um before a tv thing and um, a conference and I I went and did the skills test there's, there's a computer in the science they, they've got a national skills stem skills so I answered these questions about what I liked and what I didn't like and and um, it classified me, my ideal job was as a wind turbine maintenance engineer, except I don't like heights. So they forgot to ask me that question. So I'll, I'll sign off there just by saying that <laughs> skills is, is subtle and important and difficult. But yes, I'm a, I'm a wind turbine engineer with, with vertigo. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for that uh, provocation. And I feel, you know, the side that you started with, I think it's really important to acknowledge um, the eco-anxiety that we all feel, if not all of the time, at least very much some of the time, on reading the latest reports from the world's leading scientists. So um, rather than skating over that, I feel that it's really healthy and important for us to acknowledge that eco-anxiety and to support each other and in particular our students. Um, this is a completely natural response to a quite scary and very complex situation. However, um, that people-centric approach makes me feel optimistic. Um, so thank you, Stephen. Um, I'm now going to invite uh, Freya 
to speak to us specifically about your area of research and just frame it for us why that's so important. Yeah, certainly. But just before I, uh, I leap into that, I was at uh, a European Sustainable Energy Week conference a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things we were discussing was skills. That was one of the, uh, the themes of the conference. And one of the speakers was saying that some of the way of dealing with this eco-anxiety issue, particularly for young people, is to show them things that they can do and show them roles that they can go into in the future. And he was talking very compellingly about all the school children who are going, this is terrible, this is a disaster, we need to do things. And saying, yes, let's offer them things to do. Let's sell them. You can be a technician of the future. You can make a difference here and get people engaged and involved. So I just thought that would uh, sig you nicely onto what, uh, what you were saying. Um, but yes, yeah, so uh, my research focuses on reducing carbon from existing buildings, because in the UK and Europe, around 85 to 95 percent of our current buildings will still be around in 2050 and they are not suitable for net zero. So we desperately need to both reduce energy demand from these buildings and to then decarbonise the remaining demand. And I want to stress that this isn't just let's install a heat pump and move everything to electricity, because from a systems perspective, the electricity grid is going to have to deal with an awful lot of things when we think about we're decarbonising transport, we're decarbonising industry, we're decarbonising buildings. So buildings are something where we can make improvements to fabric efficiency and we can reduce demand through that and also through behaviour change. People will need to change their behaviours. So that's uh, that's where, where I look at my research. Um, and to do that, we need a vast level of increased skills and people in the construction industry at all sorts of jobs from bricklayers through to architects to engineers, the whole the whole scale of things. But as well as that, and again, going back to what Stephen was saying about skills for everyone, not just the workforce, people also need to have increased understanding of how their buildings work and what they can do to make a difference at a small level in terms of uh, putting up heavy curtains, in terms of having carpets on the floor and wearing jumpers, um, all things like that. And also in terms of planning, how am I going to get my building to an appropriate standard for these things? How am I going to make things work for me in my circumstances with my specific building? because it's really not a one size fits all solution in the uh, in the building sector. So those are those are, I think, the key points that I wanted to get over. I suppose the other thing is that the good news for the construction sector is that we have the technical solutions. We kind of know what needs to happen, <laughs> so we just have to do it easy. <laughs> Um, but it needs sustained effort at all levels of society. People need to change, businesses need to change, organisations need to change, and we need leadership and structural support from government <laughs> to make it all work. And I'll uh, close there for the moment, I think. Thank you, Freya. I I think feel like you've covered a wide ranging area there from eco anxiety to individual skills um, to you know the need we have for government leadership. What I find really interesting in the retrofitting side is um, you know this statistic that the majority of our buildings in 2050 exist already, and I feel that that's uh, you know, the, the statistic is quite high, but that's also a call, an empowering call um, for a number of us. And when you talk about those skills, I think something as a panel will discuss is about diversity in those skills. So it's not just the existing tradespeople or people working in technical services. It's about opening up this whole net zero skills to a wide range of people, which will both bring about you know, social benefits, the co-benefits, the social benefits of that diversity of workers. 
And um, so Ramla, I'm going to ask you now, um, you know, often we talk about technical solutions and we talk about energy, but there's also a big role for nature. And so you study one element of that, but tell us a bit about your research and your key messages, please, for Net Zero Skills. Hi, so I'm Ramla. And first of all, I really like what Freya just said because um, in, I did my undergrad in civil engineering. So when I came here, I kind of was like, okay, these buildings are not ready for climate change because, uh, yes, understatement of the year because, I mean, they were designed and we, even I can tell they were designed to keep the heat in because it's a cold country and it was a good uh, thinking at the time. But right now, things need to change. And uh, yeah, so about me, uh, right now I am an ecologist. I feel like I'm an imposter at ecology, but uh, yes, I'm looking at trees. I'm working with trees. So basically I my research is on uh, how heat waves and the rising temperature and how different trees are behaving to them. I mean, uh, in future, uh, I'll be looking at the same tree species in this area, or uh, should that be changed? Because uh, when I, the first part of my research, I looked through some satellite imagery. So it was more on a broader scale and through time, like last five years is the urban tree cover has changed in Milton Keynes over time. Uh, it has, it has, because even some people say that the temperature is a zigzag, it's not actually rising, it's rising and falling, but that's not true because that's a seasonal pattern. If you remove those patterns, then you can see a steady increase in temperature and that is affecting us. I've seen with my own eyes through satellite imagery of last five years. And right now I am more looking at the leaf level effect of temperature and heat on trees. So Steven, since you are on campus, you can come to Robert Hook site and see eight trees lined up a boulevard in front of uh, EGL. And that's those... you, is it? Yes. I've wondered who that was. Ah, I'm pleased, pleased to meet you, a line of eight trees. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so those trees are mine. And I, on those trees, I am looking, they are field maples. So it's a very common tree species among uh, the f uh, common tree species in Milton Keynes. And this is why, because I wanted to look at a native tree that's to here and been every once in a while I get a tower which is very rickety by the way but I'm not afraid of heights <laughs> so uh, yeah I have some apparatuses fluorometer and chlorophyll content meter and then I also collect the samples and go inside the lab and do some chlorophyll extractions to acetone and these days I'm actually doing a very amazing kind of new experiment where it's a controlled experiment. The same tree species, I'm exposing them to different level of heat and then looking at their chlorophyll or the fluorometer value and seeing if there is a drop. So it was, I mean, I did only my first experiment last week and it was kind of amazing and scary at the same time that between 40 to 50 uh, then they started dropping and like last year we saw 43 degrees C temperature so that, that is a very scary thought at least for me and for these specific uh, tree species and at 57 53 and 60 there was zero it means those trees literally died at that temperature so um, that is my current research i'm working on that and yeah uh, different uh, I mean, like, uh, I, I wasn't really aware of trees and how they are, but I mean, I'm looking at them and there are just so many benefits of them. Uh, carbon sequestration, for example, um, that where you don't uh, release new carbon into the air, but rather use the same carbon from the biomass and bioenergy where that was used uh, in the growth of those uh, specific uh, biomass and so they then release the same carbon so it's in a way it's a new carbon neutral kind of thing uh, solution and we like trees also for example in urban areas since we are humans and we are a bit selfish so we have to think about ourselves first and in urban areas they keep the environment cool and the small creatures it provides them habitat and home and everything so um, in a way if we look at trees they might not be uh, the only solution but it is a game changer 
uh, if if we want to be selfish even and want our own environment to if we want to breathe freely, I would say then we need trees and they need us as well. That's great, Ramla. And we'll come back and talk a little bit about the difference between planting new young trees and protecting existing older trees, um, because that has quite different implications. Yes. That's lovely. Thank you. And obviously this, you know, Ramla's a PhD student. This is a new, a relatively new net zero skill. And perhaps it's knowledge that um, our forebears would have been familiar with, but we are now doing the science on it to, to make this meaningful, if you like, in quite a, to policy making. Um, but where there are incentives to plant lots of trees, we need to be clear about where we plant them, what types of trees they are, and we need to be cognizant of the conditions they're going to be experiencing. Um, because, yeah, not there's a right tree for a right place. I think I heard that yes. from Hugh Gardens uh, the other week. So it's not it's not a one size fits all. Again, Freya, that was much the same. You know, our housing stock is so varied. So you can see some of the skills coming through are not just technical or very solutions, specific solutions focused skills. They're actually um, a broad range of skills, which sometimes are termed as softer skills. Freya, I'll let you come in now. No, sorry, it was an accidental press of the button. <laughs> um, so we're going to move to Charlotte. Um, thank you, Charlotte. Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I think the stories that we've already heard from Stephen and Freya and from Ramla really show the, the level of complexity of the Net Zero Challenge in terms of how it's perceived, what it means, in terms of how it manifests itself in, in some of the, the solutions to how we're going to progress the sustainability agenda. And I come to this panel not with a particular specific area of specialism, such as retrofit or, or trees from the perspective of a civil engineering background, but from a systems perspective. So the EAUC is a membership organisation for, for universities, for colleges, for other tertiary education providers. And I don't think the role of education institutions in developing solutions to net zero, in developing solutions to skills gaps can be can be understated. You know, not only is education where knowledge is developed, skills are developed, behaviours and attitudes developed, but it's also the home of research and innovation. And you know, some of the research that we've been introduced today um, demonstrates that. But we also reach every community in the country, you know, if you're looking at this from, an, from a UK perspective globally as well, you know, every community has its local education providers. So there's a real connection there to people and their lives and their identities and, and their, their sense of belonging. And finally, they're, they're organisations in their own right. You know, many universities are, are humongous businesses now in terms of their, their turnover, in terms of their impact on their local communities, in terms of their, their ability to affect change. So the power of education in contributing to sustainability challenges more broadly, net zero specifically, is, is, is incredible. And it's not particularly new for many education institutions either. You know, the, the carbon management agenda within, within higher education in the UK has been around for 15, 20 years. And as a result of that, there's a lot of knowledge that we have about what works, what the easier, quicker wins are. There's complexity there, um, but there, there are kind of low-hanging fruit, proverbially. Um, but also we know what the sticky challenges are. What are the critical things that actually are perhaps more systemic about how our sector operates that, that are perhaps in contradiction to some of the sustainability goals that, that we've, we've set ourselves. So as well as organisations themselves looking at how do we contribute ourselves to sustainability, to skills development, to net zero, we do that through our curriculum. We do that through our campus and operations and facilities. We do that through our research, through our partnerships. But I'm also interested in our system, kind of the system of, of education and how we encourage collaboration within organisations, between organisations and across sectors as well, because you know, the education sector is critical, but it doesn't operate in isolation. We need to think about how do we really maximise partnerships between education and civic bodies, education and employers, education and government, so that the system is enabling us to, to move towards sustainability challenges rather than providing 
barriers and challenges. So I'm really interested in how the, the cogs of the wheel fit, uh, the machine fit together and how we kind of move together towards a better understanding of and, and more urgent action towards sustainability outcomes. Because historically, there's been so much good stuff, but it does tend to happen in pockets. How do we take inspiration and learnings from those pockets so that, that, that we can apply solutions at a, at a global level? And how do we avoid playing whack-a-mole? Because that also is how it feels. I live in, in a seaside town. You can go down the seafront and play whack-a-mole where you kind of you hit one and another one pops up. I think sustainability feels a bit like that sometimes. You can you solve one problem and pop, another one comes up. And perhaps we need to be comfortable with that. But I'm, I'm really interested in how, as education providers, we can contribute not just to our institutions' um, contribution to, to net zero, but how we can be kind of wider change makers across society too. Thank you, Charlotte. I love that. Uh, for me, whack-a-mole is a symptom of our sort of linear approach to this complex, complex issues. Um, and of course, some of the skills that you've all touched on without necessarily specifically naming them are these skills around systems thinking. Um, you know, being able to see the big picture, being able to take a long term view, being able to foresee unintended consequences. Um, and one of the things, you know, that's really important, we often hear about the just transition. So we are definitely in a transition um, and that's happening you know, almost without us doing anybody doing anything, our energy mix is changing. So currently it's changing quite incrementally, but it's going to be changing very quickly if you look at how, tran how, how change or transformation happens so that we will be becoming dependent on renewables. Which, which makes sense. So one of the key skills that, that we've taught for over 25 years at the OU and Stephen's sort of been part of that journey is renewable energy. So I wonder, Stephen, if you could just say a little bit about the renewable energy, sort of the specific skills in, in that area. Thank you. Yes, of course, um, it's very exciting. Um, the world is electrifying and I agree with Freya's warning there that um, I think it was a sort of very wise warning um, that um, we all salivate at the prospect of electric this and electric that and I'm going to get an electric car and you know I'll, we're moving away from burning stuff and we're going to gather our energy from modern solar and modern wind and aren't we clever well not really because if you're just going to waste the energy as we do what was the point of spending all that capital and and, and all the materials um, cycles to produce the PV panels and the you know, and, and, all, and, and all the energy that goes into those and, and the and the effort that goes into the wind turbine. So um, first and foremost, it's uh, renewable energy. We can't talk about the renewable future without uh, looking at the elephant in the room, which is that we can improve our energy, electricity efficiency, electricity in particular, um, many, many times. I mean, LEDs are very good. Lighting was a very big, has been a great success that was a technological breakthrough but even there there are you know just because the bulb is led and it's five watts a lot of five watts on the grid does add up a lot of vampire five watts adds up just stop it everybody just stop it and um, so that so that's the first thing i'm dodging the question about renewables there renewables we've got about a quarter of our global electricity at the moment is from renewables um very large part of that from large hydro tiny tiny proportion from solar and wind but that proportion is growing really strongly and um, by the mid-century we're talking about three quarters of our electricity globally coming from wind and solar the vast majority uh, in the early years coming from wind and then taking over with solar with large hopefully large desert projects pumping sunlight available sunlight instead of fossilized sunlight fossil fuels pumping available sunlight from the world's deserts through hvdc cables into you know uh, asia from um, north um, northwestern australia for example the sun cable project from morocco into europe that's the x-link project uh, um, with the three gigawatts being scheduled to come in at devon uh, right now this is a reality all sorts of jobs all sorts of skills there um there aren't i mean if you actually look at the numbers of engineers required to set up a solar farm 
and lay the cables and do it, it it's 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 depressingly small actually i'm always amazed at how few humans can transform the place um uh, but there are lots of there are lots of really brilliant high skill stem jobs available throughout those supply chains and um but the probably the some of the most exciting probably some of the perhaps you know like you know the, the science museum thought i'd be dangling off some some turbine at north i must have i must have said i was full of excitement and risk um so i'm dangling off some turbine 200 meters up in the north sea but actually probably the biggest for, for me you know probably the biggest challenge in career satisfaction if i was thinking again of another career if i was younger might be on the behavioral challenges around energy efficiency in buildings around energy efficiency, you know those systems challenges actually actually much more challenging uh, different kind of job really um so yes, I'm, I think um, one point that I'd like to make is that if talking about diversity of people and skills. Um, I've been thinking a lot recently. I, we, we were at an event for Solstice Week with the Open University at the Multiverse in Dumfries, and I was joined by two of our eminent um, space scientists, um, Mahesh Anand and Monica Grady. And I was, um, I'm really aware that when they have a space science conference, um, all these young people turn up half of them are women and space science has no trouble attracting uh, women engineers young people it's sexy it's great it, i was at the european premier power engineering conference two months ago in glasgow which took takes place in the scc the place that cop 26 took place cop 26 a hundred thousand people many of them young banging drums saying climate justice this is what we want and the premier European event had virtually no women in it, definitely no young people and about 800 in total on the day that I was there. And, you know, once you've stopped banging a drum, you've stopped saying your slogans on a thing. You say, well, practically, what do we do? One of the key things that we do to stabilize temperatures is to shift from burning, burning stuff to create electricity to modern renewables, wind and solar. And what does that mean? It means growing the grid 10 times what it is today. Um, six times the wind market that is today within 15 years and 10 times the solar market in 15 years. Um, and no one, you know, on the ground, no one's interested. No one's there. They're just, you know, we would love to get on TV, bang the drums and say, you're stealing my future. But if you really want to make the future, if you really want to change things, you know, come on down to the engineering jobs in the first instance and make yourself known and join that, join that sector. It's, it's, it's as, it's as great, good as it could be, as sexy as it could be. <laughs> That's brilliant, Stephen. I feel like changing career and, and <laughs> you never know, watch this space. And Charlotte, if I can bring you in here on the sort of diversity element and the youth voice, I think that's something that's really important um, for all universities. How, how can we, and I think one of the questions in the chat is how can we do better around this? You know, what there's, there's the will definitely, um, are any practical examples of how we can attract in, you know, young people so that they feel that this, that, that, that the route, that education is providing them with a route to a climate safe future rather than being part of the problem? Mm. I mean, that itself is, we could, we could have a panel specifically looking at that one issue, couldn't we, Victoria? Um, I think first and foremost is to say that there has been a, a big shift, I think, in universities and this, this universities uptake of sustainability action over the last 15 to 20 years. And that's not been because of regulation. That's not been because of a big stick, somebody making them do it. It's been in response to an understanding that it's around learner expectation and that there's a societal need. You know, and I think there's a risk management piece there. You know, if we don't do it, what, what are the consequences? But the learner demand, the latent learner demand for sustainability action and expectations around organisations that they study in being responsible organisations and equipping them with the, the knowledge and skills and behaviours that they need for their futures has, has been there and has been one of the driving forces of action to this date. There's lots of really practical things that institutions can do to not just engage students in sustainability, and kind if of this is something we're doing to you, for you, but actually to really meaningfully bring student voices in as, as leaders and partners in this work. And whether that's working with your students' union, whether that's making sure that there are student spaces at the table, not just in terms of let's invite somebody along, but actually providing them with the scaffolding and the support that they need to really meaningfully contribute. 
building sustainability into things like your course rep system you know empowering students to really critique their education is this the is this the right stuff that we need to be learning and being responsive to that because i think there have been unfortunately elements historically where there's been kind of a tokenistic response to student voice around sustainability and actually really really listening to what is it that students are expecting? What is it that they need? And matchmaking that with kind of that societal need and those industry needs too is, is kind of the one of the key parts, isn't it, in terms of equipping people for their careers. I want to do a plug for a piece of work that's just this week been launched as the, off the back of a QAA project um, undertaken by the, the University of Gloucestershire. And they've developed a framework for students to help them critique their, their course critique the the education that they receive from a sustainability lens um because you know there's a lot to be done i studied i studied linguistics i'm not a uh, i'm not an engineer although Stephen, your rallying rallying cry was was very um compelling we need sustainability skills in in all areas right we, if it's a, a social science thing how do we how do we engage people in sustainability we need specialists in psychology we need specialists in communication and marketing if we're looking at uh, revising our building stock then we don't just need engineers we also need project managers we need people commissioning projects to be to be equipped with with the knowledge that they need to be able to bring sustainability into their work so this isn't this isn't a, a, an area that that, that it sits purely in the stem subjects and science and technology and engineering and maths we actually need sustainability to be woven through all of our courses not just at university but through through our whole education system so i think making sure that that, that that latent student demand is something that you're responding to, but you're bringing student voices in through existing structures as well as through new ones is, is, is really critical. Thank you. And perhaps the panel can tackle a thorny issue. I mean, Stephen, you spoke about students prote or young people protesting, campaigning, um, you know, and, and made a call for collaboration for young people working with and getting involved in the emerging in, you know, opportunities, which is so important. Um, but we, we often um, get, get requested and we have a specific question in the chat here about, you know, what, what about working with these big fossil fuel companies and the people who are doing the most damage to the planet? So, I mean, this point isn't up for, you know, challenge. I mean, it is clear that fossil fuel companies, by their very nature, have been responding to demand for energy and fulfilling it through burning, providing fossil fuels to burn. And now we're seeing, you know, a demand for modern renewables, so not creating the carbon emissions. So what's the panel's views on sort of working with the baddies um, I have my own and I'll sum up the panel's views, but I think I think it's really interesting because this is often a, a courageous conversation, a difficult conversation to have. And I just want to clarify that, you know, this isn't about any individuals uh, being baddies, but it is about institutions and this just transition and, you know, the, the very closing small window now we have to act. So what are the panel's views on uh, fossil fuel companies? Stephen, you might want to, to kick us off. Um, John Brown, the classic case in the business school, which we teach um, around this is John Brown's amazing leadership of BP, where he rebranded it uh, beyond petroleum and had a lovely picture of a flower. And for years we've all, we, no, that's not true, but for years there's been a strong sentiment that that just was complete greenwash. The classic example of an oil company saying one thing and doing another and the investments and the money and the profits were actually all flowing from fossil fuels and very little of it was going into energy efficiency and renewables. That is now not the case. It's very late. It's too late. They're naughty boys and girls over at BP, but they finally got there. They have lots of capital. They have a great deal of expertise. They have a great deal to offer us. We are in a very serious situation now. We need the fossil fuel companies to use their capital and their experience and their skills in order to accelerate that transition away from fossils and towards modern renewables. And they can help us do that. Um, so I am a fan that's got capital that can bring this situation to this situation and accelerate that. And I'm not a fan of those 
who continue to pretend that they haven't heard the message uh, or that this thing is you know, not quite settled. Uh, and I'm afraid many of the fossil fuel companies are right in the middle. They're in a very sticky position right now. I think just as the uh, students in university campuses all over the world are asking universities to lead, uh, so too are the staff of these fossil fuel companies. They are humans. They're just the same as us. Many, you, you, you may know many of them in your, in your communities. Um, and they are asking these companies uh, to respond. And those companies are creaking and they are doing it. It's not fast enough. It's not good enough. Um, but we, I, I do not agree with the, um, you know, the demonization of a whole sector, the demonization of, 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 of uh, providing us with such a valuable, wonderful, oil is a beautiful complex hydrocarbon. We, sh we should be cherishing it and doing lots of things with not burning it. Um, and, um, but this demonize, this, this, this simple demon now leads me to another thought and I'll stop, which is around Just Stop Oil, which is a, being an incredibly effective campaign. And I'm really torn about the tactics because I don't want people to be turned off by the tactics, I want them to get the message. And I'm not sure about that. And, but that's kind of where we need a different kind of skill set, don't we? We need um, people who understand about political campaigning, about PR, about marketing, about psychology, about, you know, and that's not my, that's not my skill set. So um, I don't know, I've waffled my answer there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Steve. And no, we got some good points. And I heard a lovely quote, a story from the chair of Scotland's Just Transition Commission when they were speaking to an oil company. And they, you know, this is a summary from memory, but, you know, they've got people with really great skills. They've got infrastructure. They've got labs. You know, they've, they've got this. And the question I might be paraphrasing, but the Just Transition Commission asked is, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I think, you know, the fossil fuel industry needs to grow up really quickly and anything we can do, whether that is protesting, campaigning um, or inside employees requesting that they, you know, get with a programme and grow up and respond to the challenges now. I think it's going to take every, you know, whole range of pressures um, and perhaps incentives and obviously fossil fuel subsidies are one of the incentives that we do need to be very talking about all the time in almost every meeting the data is there it is you know we we need to remove those fossil fuel subsidies so that renewables have a an even playing field um anybody else on the panel want to comment on this quite contentious issue Romla. uh hi so i think I mean, we all we, we all know that I mean fossil fuel and it's like bad for the environment and everything, but it's already here. And I would like to point out more to some of uh, the things that can be done to reduce those. Like for example, those same companies that are releasing this emission, they can uh, practice the carbon capture and storage techniques and deploy carbon capture storage technologies to capture carbon dioxide emissions produced in fossil fuel combustion. This involves in capturing carbon dioxide emissions and storing them underground or finding other beneficial uh, uses for them. Uh, mean there is the mean they can invest in the research uh, that teaches us different uh, a uh, the not so very beneficial how they're not uh, the only fossil fuels can be replaced, like Stephen said, uh, with wind energy and solar, etc. So they can invest in the research. Uh, it's kind of like the way I see it, like when you have a cigarette case and they on it, it says tobacco is bad for them, even though they are selling them, but they are also telling us how bad they are. So yeah. maybe, just, just maybe, mean there might be a middle ground that we can find because telling someone you're bad, stop it, it never works. Yeah, I like the public health warning, you know, perhaps every time I turn the light on, if there was a public yes. health warning, if I'm not buying 100% green energy, which of course we can't all buy yet because the grid yes. hasn't yet shifted. Um, Victoria, can I just jump in? I just had a thought um, based on what Ram was saying. So in carbon offsetting in general is not something um, that is is, is, is is an activity you're supposed to be doing because you're supposed to be in the mitigation hierarchy. 
reducing emissions first, not not just saying I'm, I'm going to fly to New York, which is bad, and then I'm going to invest in an offset, which is good. So one bad, one good, I'm neutral, I'm okay. And that's kind of what we're talking about with oil companies here. We're saying on the one hand, and they're increasingly big players in the renewables industry, they're doing some bad and then they're doing some good. Um, now, the rest of the market, the rest of the business sector is perfectly happy with balancing one bad with one good, putting a strap line on their website and calling themselves carbon neutral in the north. But of course, activists and so on who are getting critical about fossil fuel companies, they don't want to have that argument. They say, no, you can't do that. If they've got any oil in them, they must be bad. So we've got to have some sort of logical, philosophical, moral perspective brought to this problem. And, and by the way, all my comments about, car, about the offsetting was assuming there was an offset on the market that you could buy that was real. And that is a massive assumption. They're mostly not. So, you know, it's even worse than I've described it. So let's all be a bit more humble, a bit more self-critical about our own judgments in about when we bring moral judgments to this arena of public life. Let's just let's just think about how we exercise those judgments before we go off on one. And that's really interesting, isn't it? Because I think in this discussion, which is a really difficult area, I, I feel like, you know, these critical thinking skills, the ability to collaborate, to be respectful of difference and diversity and to actually, you know, represent collective good, you know, so to speak, perhaps to be a good ancestor, to speak for future generations, these sort of it's it's not the traditional face to face um debate um critical debate that we might have been taught in the past it's really about opening up and keeping focused on the outcome which is a collective outcome of climate safety and acknowledging that we are you know probably most people on this call are in a very privileged position and whilst we're experiencing some impacts of climate change um there by no means we're, we're in a country which generally has the capacity to support us through those climate impacts whereas the most vulnerable are in countries where there is no capacity to be supported through climate impacts and then this becomes a matter of life and death in many cases so i feel like we have the luxury um, here of, of discussing this almost theoretically but then that's back to net zero skills and the role of universities which is you know how do we have those debates universities were created for public benefit you know so who who is the public we are benefiting in our teaching and learning um a couple we've got quite a lot of questions in the chats coming through i'm just going to ask uh, the panel for a couple of um a little bit of future visioning if that's okay so regenerative you know we're, we're stuck in a situation where most of our actions you know even the most good-hearted environmental manager in the public sector um we're up against systems how do we change our systems what happens what if all of our systems were designed to be regenerative so that every every turn of the cog was producing a positive regenerative that means non-destructive you know something so it's it's about closed uh, resource loops cycling resources for as long as possible it's about high super efficiency Stephen in terms of everything we use Freya it's about like the, the complexity of the housing estate we we currently you know, it's about what if everybody had a, a similarly high quality of living so you know just to sort of push us forward into this sort of what what are the net zero skills those regenerative net zero skills what do you feel is most promising that we could all share okay i'll uh, give it a stab first <laughs> so i think firstly for thinking about buildings in particular an understanding of the benefits we're very good at talking about the negatives if we don't do this the world will end the climate will be terrible the islands will all sink you know the, it will be a disaster and browbeating people and going making them feel guilty you have to you have to change because and well that's true but also there's a lot of benefits to changing 
to having more healthy buildings, to having more comfortable buildings with higher air quality, to having less traffic on the roads, to having less air pollution. We should be selling the vision of what the world could look like if we have a regenerative um, economy and area and how much better that would be you know we've we've lost some of that sort of because it's all so urgent and so disastrous people don't like things that are scary and so you need some of the scary but you also need some of the no this is a good thing to do this isn't going to get rid of all your jobs and mean that you have to live off couscous this is going to make the world a better place <laughs> in many senses not just in terms of reducing carbon emissions and stopping climate devastation Thank you, Freya. Uh, Charlotte? Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. Um, although there's nothing wrong with couscous. Quite happy with a bit of couscous for my tea. I'll lean into that stereotype. I'm fine with that. Um, there's a book that I read recently on that very point. It's called Utopia for Realists. It's bright orange and um, sold exactly that point, Freya, that actually having a, a real clarity over the, the kind of world that we want to see and a shared buy-in to that, I think, is is critical. I think the regenerative piece is is really interesting you know if if what we're aiming for is is prosperity if what we're aiming for is is health and well-being of people and planet rather than purely you know, more cash more stuff um i think that's that's something that very much aligns with with a lot of people's vision for sustainability and i think some of that can be learned from nature as well i'm really interested um as a non-specialist in kind of biophilic design and how we look at natural systems that have evolved over millions of years to be regenerative and restorative and work well as a system, what can we learn about that? Or, um, what can we learn from that for, for how we develop our, our human systems too, I think is, is a really interesting line of inquiry for, for people far cleverer than myself. If I can just buy back in for a very quick moment. Also, what we can learn from history and how people used to live when they didn't have freely available cheap energy and how we can make uh, make better things based on that as well. Sorry, I'll shut up now. That's brilliant. No, thank you, Freya. That's really helpful. And um, Ramla, you know, then what we can learn from nature, that does feel, as Stephen said, that feels quite humbling to me that perhaps the answers around us, if we only have the eyes to see it. Um. So being like trees and environment biodiversity, it's a very, very broad subject. And if I start talking about it, it's like it's going to take ages. But me, me, you, you asked a question in, in the start saying all trees, how why should that not be removed? And I think if I give example of those with a few uh, why they shouldn't be, then it is also an eye opening thing. And it can tell us that why only this small thing that we ignore uh, has such huge impact on us. So first of all, it's it's a habitat. The way I see it, all trees, they're not just trees, they're in this institution. So they provide habitats for a wide variety of organisms. They offer nesting sites, shelter and food sources. And removing all trees can disrupt the ecosystem and lead to the loss of actually biodiversity. Uh, I mentioned carbon sequestration before, so mature trees play a crucial role in them by absorbing the carbon aside from the atmosphere through photosynthesis. They act as carbon sinks, uh, storing carbon for a long period of time. Removing these old trees releases the same stored carbon back into the atmosphere, which contributes to the greenhouse gas emissions, actually, and mean shed and cooling mean we all want to sit under the shade of a very old ancient uh, tree uh, because the shade is more cooler and there's a reason. Uh, the removing these trees can lead to increased energy consumption for cooling and have ne negative impact on the local microclimate, actually. Uh, yes, sorry, sorry, have a shout out. Brilliant, thank you. So I hear there, you know, developing skills in appreciating the nature that exists. Yes. And, you know, we hear a lot about nature biodiversity gain, and it's really about, you know, keeping in place what is there because perhaps we don't fully understand the positive benefits yet. I'm just conscious of time. Stephen, I'm going to give you the last word on, on this sort of regenerative, um, positive vision for the future. OK. 
Can you? I think I, well? I think that it's a regenerative ladder, if you like. I've just made that up. I don't. I apologise to my uh, academic friends that study that in more detail. But um, we're not all in the same place. So I congratulated myself yesterday when I caught my ego accepting a speaking invitation down south. I live in Oban, Scotland, in September. My ego took over. I was stroked. I was mad. And then I suddenly thought, no, no. I've promised no more train travel, settle down, calm down, be still. So for me, I have the privilege of doing that. But for somebody, so that for me is regenerative on my time. I'm using, you know, there is carbon associated with the train journey. So fine, I'm smarty pants and smug. I feel smug. I've, I, you know, I've got rid of, but I'm, I'm rich, I'm wealthy. I'm in a brilliant country. But what about the two, two billion people who, re, who rely on really dirty cooking stoves for their evening meal tonight? Something regenerative for them would be some sort of project or plan to get them away from the smoke to get their eyes from st stopping streaming, to stop them coughing, to have a better meal tonight. And um, so that's regenerative too. anything that anything gives them more resilience. So there's a regenerative ladder and a resilience ladder. And depending on where we are, and how lucky we are and how rich we are, how healthy we are, which country we live in and what systems we, we've got access to will depend on what means. So I think this that the notion of regenerative is not a you know, utopia, a one, a, a destination. It's something that's with us and accompanying us on our journey. I'll stop there. Thank you. So thank you to our panel. Thank you to everybody for attending today. Uh, we have uh, published a paper, Stephen and I, in Climate Perspectives, which tell you a little bit more about the technical uh, skills that we might traditionally think of. But I think this wide ranging discussion today has shown you that it's not just those technical solutions, which we've been aware of for decades what might be the game changer in bringing about the application of those solutions is how we feel about each other as people and how we're willing to address be humble perhaps address some of our habitual responses and be willing to learn net zero skills which really enable others um, to to respond to the challenges, the climate changes that we're experiencing. Um, thank you so much for all of your comments and questions in the chat. I'm sorry we haven't been able to cover them all. We will collate them and put them on our website along with the panel's responses. Um, there are more web webinars taking place across Net Zero Week. Um, so we'd love you to get involved, to come to the live events. Um, that's at www.netzeroweek.com forward slash business. Um, thank you to everybody here. And just a call uh, from the Open University and probably Charlotte on behalf of the whole sector. Get in touch with your local tertiary education provider. We need your views. We need to hear your voices. We really want you to help us shape the net zero skills we provide so that we're being effective and impactful. Thank you all and we'll see you again soon. Thank you.